joins us, proprietor of the Delta House in Charleston. Good morning, Michael. How are you? Good morning. Doing well. Your voice is nice and strong. Everybody else I talked to, with the exception of you and Senator Rucker from the Capitol, sounds like they've got a cold. Well, I've I've managed to avoid it so far, but some in the the uh, Delta House uh, have not been so lucky. <laughs> oh, who's who's been stricken by the crud? Uh, Gino Gino's been feeling a little down for about uh, three or four days now. Ah, uh, well, best of luck to Gino. Hey, did <laughs> did, yeah. did did, uh, did Hornby and Gino tell you about what I discovered about Gino's background? What's that? So, so for Christmas, I got this one book from my son about the history of the Pittsburgh Mafia. And in it is a picture of a guy named Gino Chiarelli, who was a person who had uh, mob uh, territory in the southwestern PA and West Virginia. So I sent the picture to Hornby, and I said, uh, here's a name that matches exactly with your buddy, Delegate Gino Chiarelli. In the House of Delegates, I said, you got to check and see if there's any relation. So he gets back to me, he goes, Gino's, Gino said no comment. <laughs> yeah, yeah we, we did talk about that. And he sort of, it's, uh, it, when you mention that, he gets real serious. And uh, he's like, uh, uh, we won't talk about that. Because yeah, Gino, Gino's part of the moral yeah. majority, man. He doesn't want to, he doesn't yeah. want to take out news. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to get into breaking knees with him. I, uh -huh. Keep that quiet. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Uh, Height is the Assistant Majority Whip. He serves on finance, uh, health and human resources, political subdivisions, senior children and family issues, and technology and infrastructure. Let's talk finance, Mike, because the governor has proposed three additional tax cuts, and the uh, Education Committee has proposed an additional raise, uh, superior to 5% uh, as well. So maybe you could address from a finance perspective what this state exactly has money for and what it doesn't have money for. Well, the Education Committee has never seen a dollar they didn't want to spend. Um, so Your buddy Hornby's you know, on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's a reason for that. Um, they, they commonly uh, bring out uh, bills out of their committee that spend a great deal of money. Um, and, and a lot of times I, I believe they do it and, in hopes that, you know, it's not really going to go anywhere, that it's going to die in finance, and that's usually what happens. Um, not that I'm against the bills that they bring out. It's just one of those things where you have to find the money for it, especially when the governor is saying he wants to spend this much here and this much there. You know, um, There's only so much money to go around. Even though we're having surpluses right now, you've got to be careful when you put um, permanent money into the budget. Um, it's easier when you're talking about supplementals, you know, one-time money, you know, to go to uh, good causes. But you really have to be careful when you put something in the budget that's permanent um, to make sure that we're going to have the revenues in the future to cover those those permanent increases. Now, some of them are needed, absolutely needed. Um, so it's not that the finance committee is opposed to them. We just have to be a little bit more responsible in how we respond because it's not just the uh, the education committee either. You know, all the other committees um, are bringing out bills, and some of those have fiscal notes as well. So we just have to be careful that you know we're looking at everything, including the uh, the governor's proposals, and making sure that uh, you know the revenues can sustain it. With the division of DHHR into three separate and distinct branches, Mike, now that you're getting, uh, you're getting a chance with this full 60-day session to get some information from them, uh, what are you hoping to learn about how efficient or non-efficient this split has been for DHHR? Um, well, I'll say so far, um, I'm, I haven't been – I don't get a very warm and fuzzy feeling about this, that, you know – Separating them was supposed to be able to allow us to get down into the weeds and find out where those efficiencies are and to make them more manageable. Um, at this point, all it's done is, is each division has tried to you know, spend as much of that money as they can, and I don't see a whole lot of efficiencies at all. But, you know, that's, that's where we get down into it and start taking stuff away from them and, you know, line by line – 
digging down into stuff. Um, and it makes it easier for us to dig into stuff line by line and say, hey, you know, what is this and, and why, why are we spending it on such and such? Or, or you know, this particular line item um, didn't all get used last year. Why are you reappropriating it uh, into next year if you didn't use it all last year? Maybe we need to cut that back. So that's what the, the, the finance uh, committee is trying to do at this point and uh, trying to make them more efficient in, in spite of themselves. Bill, you had concerns about this when it was split into three. Initially. Yeah, yeah. Mike and I uh, have talked about this quite a bit, and I think it all comes back to leadership. Have the directors of the three branches uh, been identified, and, and are they in place now, Mike? Uh, yes, they are. Um, but don't hold me to their names. I know Secretary Caruso is in charge of facilities, and I think Secretary Priscilli is in charge of health. I forget the human resources um, direct or er, secretary. Well, I hope it works. But again, I, as you and I have talked before, I'm concerned that there's not there's not enough money available to hire the type of people you're really looking for because uh, this is, uh, I'm not saying throw good money after bad. It's just that we see that to get something done, you have to have a good leader. And these folks cost money. And I'm not sure that West Virginia is going to pay for that. Well, Bill, you bring up a good point, um, and it seems like, I mean, that's not the only department where there's that issue. It seems like, uh, in many cases, the state does not pay um, what the the private sector pays for certain positions. Um, and, and, you know, DHHR is just one of those areas. Uh, the... Um, the department of the auditor's department came in the other day and said they had some um, full-time uh, employee vacancies and they've had them for some time. Then the turnover is, is pretty great in that area. Um, in particular, with CPAs, you know, and the auditor they absolutely need CPAs. But they say the CPAs come out of of school. They hire them right out of school. They're they're with the auditor's department for a year. They get a little bit of experience, and then the private sector snatches them up and, and pays them a whole lot more. Um, so it's a problem across the board with a lot of uh, state agencies. Now, I have I've entered um, a, a bill into drafting. Um, I'm proposing a bill that helps solve that. It takes um, their uh, full-time employees, so that their personal services is where you pay wages and salaries. So if you have um, full-time employee vacancies, then you can reappropriate the money that you didn't pay them into the next year. And, and all the agencies do that. So there may be some agencies that have several hundred thousand dollars sitting over in reappropriated funds because they, they couldn't hire individuals. So the bill I have proposed allows them to use those reappropriated funds for a tuition reimbursement um, program um, that brings uh, professional staff in, pays for their tuition or tuition reimbursement for those individuals as long as they agree to stay in that department for a period of five years. So I'm hoping that maybe that will help alleviate a lot of those vacancies. Yeah, uh, I hope so. And uh, you're exactly right. This extends beyond DHHR. Uh, where DHHR comes into play, though, mm -hmm. is that the decision was split into three parts. And so you're, in effect, increasing the outlays uh, for uh, uh, three skill managers. Uh, that you do. And also the other factor, especially DHHR, they're under the spotlight. They're being criticized. Everything they do or everything they do, they're being, uh, uh, is highly visible. Uh, so you're asking quite a unique individual to come in and expose themselves to the criticism they w they're bound to get with money that they, they could get a lot more in the private sector. So it's a, it's a, uh, it's kind of a, a tough situation for both the individual and also the state. It is, but it also allows them individually to focus, narrow their focus yeah. a whole lot more. You're right. Uh, is where I think that helps. And it also allows us 
as legislators to narrow our focus as well, that we can get down in the weeds now um, with just the facilities and, and try to figure out where the inefficiencies are there. <clears throat> and it's a whole lot easier when it's not under this huge umbrella where, you know, money gets hidden in line items and, and you know, it's just, it's just too hard to, to try to decipher what's going on. Yeah, you've mentioned facilities two or three times. Of the three branches, that's going to be the easiest one to monitor. In fact, that's going to be kind of the underpinning of all the others. Uh, it's the Absolutely. others. It's the others that are going to be the make or break the success of DHHR. You you are absolutely correct. Bill loves to hear that, by the way, Mike. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's why. I, yeah, Mike, come on back. I love to. <laughs> need you to have you on the table every day. You say things like that. Mike. Bill's got a parakeet at home. Every time he walks in, the parakeet says, Bill, you're absolutely correct. Yeah, and that, and after this morning's introduction, is sure not Bonnie. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you, got some, you got some apologizing to do. Matt Miller. The, the hard part, though, too, is we can't expect this to – you know, take a short amount of time. I mean, you take an agency that is as large as what the DHHR is, divide it into the three parts, and now have to go through everything, uh, get the right leadership in place. I mean, this is a many, many year process to try to fix something that has been broken for a long time. Yes, Matt, you're absolutely right. This is going to take years to to get right. Hey, hold a second, Mike. <laughs> you can only say one of us are right. Now you say both of us are right. Well, listen, yeah, no, yeah, I'm losing no, my credibility here. here. You know, there's there's a lot of a lot of intelligence in the room today. That's all I have to say. You know, um, but this is going to take years. It's going to take a lot of digging. Um, um, but splitting them into three just makes that easier for us to do that digging and uh, and to get it right. But you're right. It's going to take a few years. This isn't going to be overnight success. With that in mind, are you kind of is, is there one branch now of the three that you kind of start with and dig there and then work your way to the others? Or do you kind of have to divide it amongst various members of the Finance Committee and other agencies and you're kind of digging into all three at one time? Well, for me personally, I I deal with the IDD waiver, so I start digging in there in the areas that I know, um, me personally. Um, but I can see where there are other individuals um, in the legislature that may have a some knowledge about facilities, and that's where they'll start digging in. So it'll be the individual um, that'll bring a lot of these issues back to committees and and. I, I probably I think that's probably how it'll happen. I want to jump back to a little bit to the the education that that we were talking earlier and and potential use of of excess funds and so forth. And you talked about obviously you don't want to put things that are going to be recurring year after year. Uh, I know that money was recently given through the school building authority. And it, when you look at education facilities are obviously a, a huge thing. Is there any of this excess that goes into that? entity to be able to help maybe with buildings and so forth across the state? Uh, occasionally, if, if the governor puts it in the, his budget that way, or if maybe if uh, some, some bill comes out of education to do such, such a thing. Um, I don't know if anything's in the works right now in the school building authority, but occasionally we do that if there's surplus money um, and, and there's uh, a need, if there's a school that needs to be built or something like that. Um, excess money can be put in there. Yeah, it just seems like you know each year the school building authority gets so many requests and and has a certain amount of money and have to figure out how to divvy that up. I didn't know if that was something with the excess sure. that we have that that could be uh, helpful. Uh, we haven't talked much about you started with tax cuts uh, as well as the the request from the education committee for increased uh, funding in other places. Uh, talk more about the tax cuts. What what is it that the governor really wants to see happen? You know, I'm not sure what the governor wants to see happen when he talks about tax cuts. We've already, you know, we did the 21 and a quarter percent tax, uh, personal income tax cut last year. Um, there's going to be triggers. That's going to get triggered again this, this year. So um, I'm not sure what tax cuts he's looking for. Um, can you be more specific? Yeah, there's, I think there was a child uh, tax credit. Uh, it was one of the things, uh, a homestead exemption. Uh, there was uh, something he was looking to tinker with on that, I think. Uh, but if you're not familiar with those, we can move on to. 
Yeah, I'm not a whole, real familiar with those. All right, so a couple of bills that uh, one is a carryover you tried to get through last year, and another one deals with uh, zoning. So I want to start first with your carryover from last year. The West Virginia Consumer Financial Privacy Act of 2023, Mike, that's in judiciary right now. Uh, let's revisit that. Tell everybody what that will do, should it pass, and uh, why you are sponsoring it. Well, that, that particular bill, um, so when you fill out an application for credit, that goes to their credit bureaus, and then the credit bureaus have that information, and they have the ability to sell your information right now. This would prevent that. You would have to opt in to that. So anytime you uh, fill out an application, you would have to give them permission before they could sell your information. Um, so it, it passed out of the House last year unanimously um, and went over to the Senate, and uh, it, it got into Banking and Insurance Committee over there, and it just died in committee, um, which didn't surprise me because – it's the bankers that use this information. They're the ones buying it from the credit union, so they want to see it continue. They don't want to see that go away. Um, so I, I've talked a little bit to Craig about it. I think it'll get out of the House again this year. Um, and I've asked Craig that when it gets to the Senate that he send it straight to judici judiciary and not to banking and insurance. And then hopefully that's how we'll get it passed in the Senate side. HB 4779 seeks to repeal requirements of comprehensive zoning ordinance for counties to collect development fees. I assume this has to do with the way of collecting impact fees without passing zoning, Mike? That is correct. All this does is eliminates the line that requires uh, a comprehensive zoning uh, program for you to have impact fees, um, for a county to have impact fees. Um, you know, there's, I'm hearing some opposition to it from some different people, um, but, you know, I was sort of, the, most of these, um, all these counties have the ability to have impact fees now. You just have to have a zoning ordinance to do it, and I'm trying to strip away that requirement. The people in Berkeley County have spoken loud and clear. They don't want zoning. Um, and but they they do want impact fees the, the the development going on in and around berkeley county um is exorbitant it is and the uh infrastructure is not keeping up so something has to be done uh to help the county out um when when not we have all this building uh mike uh go uh, explain, if you will, impact fees, and specifically, I think of impact fees with water and sewer. But does it also extend to educate uh, building school uh, schoolhouses, school buildings? It, it it could. So the impact fees, I um, mean, that would be. I left the bill open ended that the county commission can decide what the impact fees are, and the county commission can decide where they need. Um, to use it where the the need is the most it, it could be it could be schools it could be water infrastructure it could be just about anything um, that they decide it needs to be um, to to increase you know the capacity of Berkeley County for the influx of, of individuals people coming to our, our county and and the pushback is that due to it's considered another tax is that the pushback yeah, that's that's the pushback that you know that the the, um, the builders are just going to pass the impact fee along um, to the individual buying. Well, that there's some truth to that, um, but it'll be the majority of the people they pass it on to are the people that are coming to West Virginia and, and buying in, in West Virginia. I assume this is only on new home construction, Mike, and not on existing houses. That's correct. What is the argument for linking the impact fees with zoning? I cannot tell you. That's just how it's written in code um, currently, and that's that's why I'm trying to strip it out. Right, but but the arguments against that you're not, you know, the, no one's giving you like a real reason when they're saying, nah, I don't think we should do that. Well, but why? Why why do they need to be linked? No one can give you that answer. No, 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 nobody's giving me that answer. No. When impact fees were passed where I live shortly after 2000, uh, the money was ultimately distributed between schools, uh, emergency responders, uh, libraries, 
the things that expand in need when you have an expanding population. You need more police, you need more fire, you need more EMS, you need uh, libraries, you need schools. These right. are the things Correct. that happen when population increases. In effect, with the ward and sewer, we do have impact fees, but they're called facilities improvement fees. Mm -hmm. uh, but yet you have to go, at least you used to have to go to the Public Service Commission to get approval for each one of these, which is highly bonersome and very onerous as well. So. And, and eventually the, the county will start collecting, you know, uh, real estate taxes and stuff from these individuals that move here but you know bill knows being a commissioner that the impact of the development is felt upon the county way before you get to start collecting um any real estate uh, income exactly yeah i'm told that lag can be almost two years when it comes to collecting real estate taxes yeah. Correct. But but the county's got to provide schools and, and roads and water and, and all the infrastructure, you know, day one. Yeah. And emergency services, police and fire. Correct. A little bit. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mike, you're leaving that open ended as to what kind of fees can be collected for the impact fees and how much money. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I don't think the, the state should be dictating to the local government um, how they govern. That's that's up to the county commission and the people that elect the county commission uh they have to answer to them so um i don't think the state needs to get overly involved in that well, speaking Mike, of which go ahead bill i was going to say i reach you i wish you great success in this is something that needs to be done where are you in the process of getting it getting it through um right now it's uh it's just a bill and we're, we're trying to get it through committee uh, speaking of uh, county government uh, and self-determination, is there a movement for a home rule vote for counties in the state this year? Um, well, the, the County Commission Association has put forth a bill, and I think it's, I'm not sure which committee it, it's originating out of, maybe GovOrg, um, but they've put forth a bill for sort of home rule where it gives the county the ability to have a 1% sales tax or what they call a, a admission and amusement tax, which, you know, is for those, uh, those counties that have ski resorts and those types of things. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know how much traction that one's going to get. I know that, that uh, Berkeley County was in favor of that particular legislation. Um, so I don't know how well it's being received yet. Um, we'll just have to see how that one plays out. Mike, thank you for your time this morning. Final word is yours if you need it. Uh, well, just just trying to get into the swing of things down here and, and, and working for the people of uh, the 92nd District in Berkeley County and, and doing the best we can. So if you need anything, please don't hesitate to call. Um, and if you're in Charleston, the Delta House is always open. <laughs> Mike Height, Rush Chairman. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you, guys.